and Governmental Operations. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, Chair of the Committee. As always, you can tweet me at Ben Kalos, uh, particularly folks who are watching uh, the live stream or uh, you're watching live on TV. If uh, it is not uh, September 28th, you're watching a rerun, but uh, otherwise you can uh, tweet me with some questions. We'll be trying to uh, pay attention and uh, pass those along. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the members of the committee who are present, and uh, that would be Carlos Menchaca, who was actually here early. So if we can just uh, thank him for that. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the huge number of people from city agencies uh, in the audience uh, today, uh, as well as uh, our folks who have joined us from the public. So I want to take a uh, moment. Uh, you may see a bunch of other people sitting here and wondering who they are. Uh, they're the committee staff who do a lot of the great work uh, that help us uh, as a city council oversee and investigate our other branches in the system of checks and balances we call a democracy. Uh, our committee council, Brad Reed, our policy analyst, Elizabeth Cronk, our uh, finance analyst, Zachary Harris, my legislative director, Paul Restrick. I'd like to thank them all for their work on the committee and putting together today's hearing, which uh, came together over uh, this one was took several, at least several years in the making. Uh, on April 21st of last year, the mayor signed into law Introduction 810, creating Local Law 47 of 2016. Local Law 47 uh, was meant to stem the tide on what we saw in the city, which was an increase uh, in, uh, in the perception of a decline in quality of life when people were doing surveys and Quinnipiac polls and others, people all over the city kept saying quality of life was going down. And so we were trying to look at what was happening around that and at that time we saw that uh, we were writing violations but not necessarily collecting on them. And so uh, this administration in particular, I know the mayor agrees with this too, we're not about just trying to write violations to make money. Uh, the purpose of writing violations is actually to correct behavior. And uh, as we looked at it, we were trying to come up with a solution. And so the two items that we looked at is you might got a, get a violation in one place. Let's say you left your trash out. Maybe you didn't recycle. Many different ways you can get in a violation. There's quite a lot of laws here in the city of New York. Uh, and another agency might give you a license when perhaps they shouldn't if they knew that you always left your trash out and all the neighbors were angry about it. So we passed Introduction 810, which gives city agencies the power to say, you know what, uh, even though we're a separate agency, it looks like you owe the city money or you uh, have this habit of every single day you leave out your trash and then Department of Sanitation writes you a violation, you pay it, but that might be cheaper than having a garbage hauler pick it up or what have you. And so the idea is, how do we actually get them to change that behavior? So Local Law 47 specifically uh, gave authority to city agencies to suspend, revoke, or deny permits or licenses from individuals and business entities of unpaid fines resulting from the Environmental Control Board. Uh, and those are quality of life violations. Uh, when this law was created, the city of New York was owed $1.8 billion in outstanding ECB or quality of life debt. Through an amnesty program and other collection efforts, ECB debt collection has increased 22%. However, there still remains $981 million in outstanding debt, according to the Department of Finance. Uh, and we'll hopefully get an updated number very soon. Local Law 47 was created to give the agencies the tools to compel scoff laws to pay the money they owe the city. This nearly billion dollars in money that could be spent on school lunches, which we now have universal school lunch, so uh, there's, here's hoping for supper and snacks. Uh, senior centers, building affordable housing, and some of the other priorities that this administration and I hold it dear. Unfortunately, 17 months after it was signed by the mayor, not a single agency has complied with the law. 11 of the 13 did not even bother to submit a required report. All 13 did not promulgate rules uh, through which they would revoke or suspend licenses and permits. We're here today to discuss 
with representatives of these agencies why they ignored the requirements of Local Law 47 and how they can compel scofflaws to pay their fines and change their behaviors or risk not receiving uh, licenses to continue doing business. And uh, with that, uh, our, we will be receiving testimony from uh, Jeff Shear, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Finance, with whom we've worked very closely on the amnesty program and this legislative Patrick pa uh, package, as well as uh, Patrick Whaley, who is the Assistant Commissioner for the Department of Buildings. Uh, though we have 13 agencies that issue ECB violations and quality of life, uh, the, there are two that lead the pack with the most violations or the, uh, the highest amount in violations and uh, DOB leads in the highest amount. When you get a violation with DOB, it can be quite costly. Uh, so we will now uh, swear both in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Jeff, if you'd like to begin. Yes. Good afternoon, Chairman Kalos and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I am Jeffrey Shear, Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services for the Department of Finance. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the collection of debt resulting from violations adjudicated by the Environmental Control Board, which now refers to an adjudication process within the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, OATH. ECB summonses are issued by many city agencies for safety and environmental infractions, such as building code and sanitation violations. The primary purpose of the summonses is to change behavior so that we may all live in a safer, cleaner city. Collecting past due debt on these violations provides incentive for this behavior and has the additional benefit of generating revenue for essential city services. There are over 20 city agencies that issue summonses that are adjudicated by oath. Upon issuance, summonses are stored in a computer system maintained by oath. Respondents to such summonses can address them either by paying or disputing them at an oath ECB hearing. As the council is aware, Oath is an independent administrative tribunal, tribunal. As part of the city's administrative law court, Oath ECB's function is to provide due process in cases that originate from the city's many enforcement agencies in a form that is unbiased and neutral. In 2014, approximately 60% of city agency summonses were paid in full and an additional 9% were dismissed for various reasons before referral to DOF. Oath files judgments for the unpaid remaining balances and then transfers the judgments to the New York City Department of Finance for collection. This in turn means DOF is working hard to collect on approximately 30% of the remaining summonses. Thanks to support from the City Council, the Department of Finance administered forgiving fines, the ECB amnesty program for judgment summonses. The 90-day program, which ran from September 12th through December 12th, 2016, forgave interest and 100% of default penalties for debtors who complied with the program's terms and conditions. More than $100 million in default penalties and interest were waived during the program, and as a result, DOF was able to collect $45 million associated with 128,000 paid violations. As a result of forgiving fines, total ECB judgment revenue in fiscal year 17 was $91.7 million, a 50% increase over the $60.9 million collected in fiscal year 16, and more than double the $42 million collected as recently as fiscal year 14, when DOF began ramping up its collection efforts. I'd like to thank Chairman Kalos, Council Finance Chair Ferreris Copeland, and Council Member Peter Koo in particular 
for helping us spread the word to raise awareness about the program. I also would like to thank City Summons issuing agencies for handling an increased number of inquiries from respondents needing to address underlying conditions for compliance summonses in order to, com um, to qualify for amnesty. Now that the amnesty program is over, DOF is ramping up enforcement for unpaid and uncontested violations issued by the city enforcement agencies. Enforcement efforts for violations in judgment debt include referrals to the city marshals and the city sheriff to make on-site visits and, if necessary, seize assets to collect. For example, in FY16, DOF issued 1,464 execution referrals, and in FY17, DOF issued 1,511 execution referrals, a 3% increase despite the fact that DOF did not issue executions for the first half of fiscal year 17 due to our preparation for and implementation of the amnesty program. In fiscal year 18, we expect a much higher number of legal executions since we will be issuing them throughout the entire year. Also, pursuant to Local Law 45 of 2016, which established the amnesty program, we have modified settlements offered to respondents and others seeking to pay a reduced amount for ECB oath judgments in return for an admission of liability. We now offer settlements that abate one half of default penalties with no abatement of interest. Borrowing from the success of amnesty, however, we now offer settlements online at a836-citypay.myc.gov slash citypay slash ECB. This is a faster, more convenient process than paper submission of settlement agreements. In response to Local Law 47, DOF took a close look at our own internal processes even though we do not issue licenses and permits. We identified one opportunity where it would make sense to check for oath ECB judgment debt, the merger and apportionment that is subdivision of property parcels. Since most oath ECB violations are issued against property owners, we want to make sure owners requesting such changes are properly maintaining their buildings and land. This could have significant impact. In 2016, DOF received 1,071 requests for mergers and apportionments on property parcels. On February 10, 2017, DOF published draft rules pertaining to the merger and apportionment process, including a requirement to resolve outstanding oath ECB judgments. Owners could resolve the judgments by either making full payment or entering into payment plan prior to DOF completing the requested action. A public hearing was held on March 28, 2017. DOF has just finished making revisions to the draft rules in response to public comments and has submitted them to the law department for review before they are finally promulgated. By its own actions, DOF is supportive of the concept that agencies should suspend, revoke, and deny licenses and permits for certain reasons. While city agencies may seek information and assistance from either OATH or DOF when making OATH ECB debt a required step in the licensing or permitting process, we, DOF, welcome all inquiries and referrals. We also regularly share OATH ECB judgment inventory statistics with other agencies so that they may better understand the nature of the outstanding debt. However, since the provisions of Local Law 47 are clearly aimed at agencies that issue licenses, permits, and registrations, there is little additional action we can take other than the aforementioned merger apportionment rule promulgation and supporting any agency that chooses to issue rules to reflect its current or expanded practices. The Department of Finance appreciates the attention the Council has brought to this issue and our ongoing work to improve our collection efforts.
I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso and Councilmember Joe Borelli. Uh, and uh, we will uh, go on to the Department of Buildings. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. I am Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased, here, I'm pleased to be here to offer testimony concerning the implementation of Local Law 46 of 2016. Local Law 47, rather. Local Law 47 uh, authorizes agencies that issue licenses, permits, or registrations to adopt a rule enabling them to deny, suspend, or evoke said licenses, permits, or registrations based upon uh, unpaid debt resulting from violations adjudicated by the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. An exception is provided for agencies that are in substantial compliance with the law upon its enactment. Furthermore, when choosing to exercise this authority, the law requires agencies to consider the risks withholding licenses, permits, and registrations can have on promoting unlicensed, unpermitted, and unregistered activity. Finally, annual reporting is required of those agencies that adopt such a rule in response to this law. The department issues licenses and registrations to more than 33,000 individuals in 38 different trades, and last year issued over 165,000 building permits to perform construction work ranging from minor renovations to new building construction. As part of the code revision process that culminated with the adoption of the 2008 building code, the department included a provision that allows us to deny, suspend, or evoke license and registration renewals based upon unpaid penalties, which was subsequently expanded to include requests for new licenses and registrations. The department has taken full advantage of this authority and will not issue or renew any licenses or registrations unless all penalties resulting from violations issued by any agency are paid. In 2016, the department issued 2,764 new licenses and registrations and 5,773 license and registration renewals for which nearly $1.4 million in penalties was collected. Given our work withholding licenses and registrations until penalties are paid, the department determined that it is in substantial compliance with Local Law 47 prior to its enactment. The department looks forward to continuing our work assisting the Department of Finance in their efforts to collect unpaid debt to the city. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to testify before you today, and I welcome any questions you may have. I want to thank the first two agencies for their uh, testimony and ask the sergeant at arms if we can uh, lower my mic a little bit. Uh, I'd also like to invite uh, four other agencies uh, to join the panel for the Q&A if possible. If we can bring up enough chairs. Uh, the Department of Sanitation, we have uh, Thomas uh, Melora, Director of Environmental Police. For DCA, we have Mary Cooley, Director of City Legislative. Uh, for I think we'll bring those two agencies up, as well as DOHMH, Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health. And we do have uh, the, sure. we'll also bring up Fire Department of New York, uh, Jason Shelley, Director of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. And we will uh, swear you in just so we can get that all taken care of at once. Okay, uh, we will have Casey Adams for the Department of Consumer Affairs instead of Mary Cooley. Can you raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, typically the chair asks questions first. However, in my committee, we, I, I tend to give deference to some of my members. Uh, we ha as council members, we often have to be in place, more than one place at a time, so I would like to turn it over to Councilmember Joe Borelli who has a quick question for DOB. Thank you, thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Appreciate you being here. 
Um, just a quick question about the relationship between oath uh, and DOB violations. I I've seen cases where oath he hearings have been adjourned uh, for whatever reason oath decides to adjourn cases or uh, to delay cases or give new hearing dates, but people are still faced, people still get the DOB violations for the violations that are not adjudicated yet. Why, why does that happen w within the DOB and oath system? Like why is there not better correlation? I'm not quite sure I understand your question. The violation obviously is issued prior to the hearing, um, as is the normal practice. So, so DOB issues the penalty associated with the, so someone gets a violation for, um, you know, illegal construction, or whatever the violation is for. They get a violation with an oath hearing date. Now, if those people follow the instructions on the violation, hire an architect, do what they're gen generally, generally do to follow the, the violation, their hearing date gets moved. Why do they still often get a DOB violation with a penalty imposed in the mail? If they correct the conditions um, on or before the date of that hearing, and at the hearing they demonstrate that they've corrected it, that satisfies our need. Uh, and then those violations automatically get dismissed? The violation is dismissed upon correction of the violation. That's correct. Okay. That, that was the question of a constituent, and I really had no honest answer. I couldn't figure it out. And I, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Varelli. So we'll start off with a series of questions. I just want to thank the Department of Finance for leading by example. Uh, we did not believe that you were covered by the law, but we're glad that you voluntarily complied with it and uh, did so. And we would love if you would also include any voluntary reports and if you could send a copy of the rules you adopted. So thank you. Yes. And, and to be We'll send a copy of the draft rules. The rules have not yet been adopted. They, we expect them to be um, issued shortly after the law department's review, so we'll, we'll share them once they're adopted. And um, once they are adopted, we will um, keep statistics and share those as well. I also happen to be a, a little bit of, uh, I, I, I like evidence-based governance. Uh, I believe in things like global warming, it's, it's a problem. Uh, and so uh, is it possible for Department of Finance to uh, help us, whether internally it doesn't need to be official report, but test the difference between um, agencies that are using local law 47 for enforcement and change in behavior and collection versus agencies that aren't so that we can see what the actual financial impact of the law is? So we really are dependent on, on those other agencies to understand the impact. So when we look in our database and there is a payment on a violation, we don't know necessarily if the payment came in as a result of one of our letters or an enforcement action or an agency checking um, um, as part of the licensing or permitting process. So we, we can, we're available to work with the agencies um, to help them get that information, but we really are dependent on them to sort of call out when the, when the payments come in as a result of that process. I, so I guess then the question is, so, so is there somebody between Department of Finance and the mayor who is charged with uh, maintaining quality of life for, who has the charge and authority to say to the agencies, can you work with Department of Finance to report on when you're using this power and it's resulting in collections and when you're not and it isn't and whether or not we're seeing that ultimate change in behavior? I don't know if I can answer that. I, I think each agency has the responsibility uh, of adhering to the law and reporting on it. Thank you. So um, I'll at the bill signing ceremony for Local Law 47, our mayor, Bill de Blasio, described the bill by saying, quote, this bill means that if you don't pay your fines, it may impact your application for a license or registration or whether you get to keep that license or registration, end of quote. And he described it as part of a package of bills that, quote, will give us important tools to collect money owed to the city, 
meaning to the people of New York City, end quote. So my question is this, the council and mayor have given you an important tool to use to collect money owed to the people of New York City. Have any of your agencies used that uh, tool? So we will uh, start from uh, left to right and we will omit D DOF. So the buildings department has not exercised the tools, as you call it, in, within local law 47. The law um, provide, relieves agencies, I'd say, of the obligation of adopting a rule and therefore performing the reporting if they are in substantial compliance with the law. And as discussed in my testimony, the department is in substantial compliance with the law because prior to its enactment, we've had processes in place to ensure that for every license that we issue, upon the issuance of a new license or upon the renewal of a license, we check across all agencies to see if there's outstanding debt. And we don't renew a license or issue a new license if there is any. Uh, so I, I took the liberty of, uh, uh, first I just want to acknowledge for those just tuning in, uh, agencies and council members engage in ongoing conversations around many different issues in the district. So. We, we've had conversations ahead of this. I, I took a moment, I, I'll need this back, but I took a moment to print out Local Law 47. And uh, if you can go to uh, Section B, I have marked it. And we will read the section together and decide what, do you happen to have it with you? I do. Okay, could you read uh, section, section B? Sure thing. And you can stop at such rules. Any agency that issues notices of violation returnable to ECB or, the, or to oath shall promulgate rules to implement the authority granted by subdivision A of this section. Uh, except that any such agency, as of the effective date of the law, has adopted a rule or policy that substantially meets the requirements of this section, shall not be required to promulgate such rules. And, and if you can. can continue through the, the four items that the rules have to address. You'd like me to read all four items? Yes? Okay. Such rules shall include, but need not be limited to, uh, factors to be considered in an agency's determination, whether to, whether to deny, suspend, terminate, or revoke, including. One, whether the such applicant, license, permittee, or re registrant has other unpaid penalties, taxes, or other debt owed to the city. The amount of the unpaid civil penalties imposed by ECB or oath where the violation underlying the unpaid penalties imposed by ECB or oath was issued by such agency, whether such agency is one of a series of violations returnable to such board or tribunal, and the nature of the underlying violation, and number four, finally, whether the unpaid civil penalties imposed by ECB or oath were imposed pursuant to a finding of default that was subsequently vacated, or whether the applicant licensee permittee or registrant has made a request to vacate such default and obtain a new hearing pursuant to the rules of such board uh, or tribunal. Okay, so in, in, in layman's terms, the agencies shall promulgate rules. However, if you already have rules that meet one through four, you're, you're good, right? You don't have to adopt new rules, is, is that your, you, are, you do not need to adopt rules if you're in substantial compliance with this section. Okay, so the question for you would be, what rules do you already have in place that meet the four requirements here? We are in substantial, we're in substantial compliance with this section because currently we have a process in place that allows us to not issue or not renew licenses and registrations based on outstanding debt. And, uh, would you be willing to, do you know offhand, because you seem very prepared, which is great. I love when agencies are prepared. Do you have the sections of the uh, New York City rules and regulations that meet these rules? I do. Awesome. I am very impressed. Thank you. I mean, I, this, this should be normal. 28, uh, Title 28, 401.19 um, speaks to our ability to revoke and suspend um, licenses and registrations. In addition to that, um, rules of the City of New York 104-01 provides us with the authority to not issue a license or registration based on outstanding debt. And is that 
PCV debt only relating to DOB violations or if somebody has a violation from DSNY, does that also apply? It does, it applies to all agencies and we collect, uh, we sh I should say, we hold up licenses, registrations based on debt across all agencies. So it's not limited to DOB debt based on the, the issuance of DOB violations. And so how many have you uh, used that authority? How many times have you used that authority last year? So every time we receive an application for a new license or an application to renew a license, we perform this check. And so as outlined in my testimony, we issued 2,764 new licenses and uh, renewals were 5,773. So now we perform that check for every one. And 2016, through that process, um, there was $1.4 million in penalties that were collected by the city. So because of the sort of uh, the value of our licenses that we issue, they're quite valuable, um, everybody pays up. So you, you've given us the number in terms of big scope, 1.4 million. Would you be willing to further comply with the law and give us the breakdown of which licenses and how many of them were held up and uh, it, to result in that big final number? So you can see the, uh, the to go back to first grade math class, Will you show me your work? I, I don't have the work to show, but I'm happy to show it to you. That, that, that is very helpful. Uh, and I guess one other piece that I just wanna go highlight right now, and we'll, we'll let other folks get to the first question because we kind of dove right in here, uh, but Number three is whether such violation is one of a series of violations returnable to such board or tribunal and the nature of the underlying violation. Is there a section of the rules and regs that speaks to people, who, people persons, or organizations, or uh, companies made up of those same people who have repeat violations over and over and over again? So as part of our check for a licensee, um, the licensee may have incurred multiple violations for which there are multiple penalties associated with. And so that's captured by, by our review as well. So is, is there a situation where somebody has hundreds of violations and you just say, you know what? You don't get to do this anymore because you're not gonna follow the law. So as a general matter, yes, it's n but it, was n it wouldn't be as a result of the penalties it would be as a result of, of the particular violations. So if a licensee is engaging in illegal work repeatedly, that's putting the safety of New Yorkers at risk, certainly we would move forward with a process to revoke their license. But it wouldn't per se be a result of the penalties that they've accumulated. W would you, how many times did that happen last year? Um, I'd have to get back to you on a specific number. I don't know offhand. It certainly happens regularly. Okay. Um, so. In, uh, give me one moment, sorry. So I, I think we're on the same page that, and just to correct me, if an operator has dozens of safety violations or um, doesn't work without a uh, permit quite often, you would consider withholding permits, registrations, licenses from them, and in fact, even revoking. Certainly. And, and you believe there is a link between the number of violations issued and our overall safety on a site? Absolutely. So I guess um, one of the concerns, and, and hopefully as we move forward with different construction safety legislation, but last Thursday, two construction workers died on two separate sites. The operator of the site at 161 Maiden Lane had been cited at least 15 times for violations returnable to oath. So the question there is just, was, was that site in question a safe site? So those fatalities regrettably happened on Friday. Um, your question's a good one. It's something the department's looking into and is part of our investigation that's ongoing. And so I guess the question being that if the uh, DOB were to exercise additional powers granted under local law 47 or uh, expand on the rules that we're currently pulling, <laughs> to review during the hearing, uh, 
there, perhaps these 15 violations would have automatically been caught by new rules you could promulgate that says if somebody has over 10 violations for uh, not having or not even, I would say, three strikes and you're out. If you, you get cited three times for not having guardrails, that that is enough to say, listen, you're, you're not an operator that we want in this city. We want you to keep our construction workers safe. And like, we're sorry to tell you, but like you need to find a different job because you're not doing your job right here. Tend to agree, and that authority already exists. I think the one question that I give you is, you know, there are just about 300 different types of conditions for which we can issue violations. Some are, you know, terribly egregious, and some are, you know, relatively administrative. I don't think we should focus so much on the number of violations, but actually those specific types of violations. If those violations are failure to safeguard, guardrails, things like that, certainly that raises a flag with the department currently. And based on that, we will perform an investigation and take appropriate action. So, so I think, um, so that's really good to hear. It, it would be helpful, so will you, will you share, whether it's through this report or voluntarily and, and, and just on an ongoing basis, how many licenses, permits, registrations are being revoked or suspended uh, in response to these types of situations? Certainly. And I think the other piece here is just, um, we're gonna look at the rules and regulations, and again, we're doing it as we speak, but um, the reason we had asked your agencies and all the agencies to promulgate your own uh, rules and regulations is because I do not have as much expertise as somebody at Department of Buildings does. And so we were hoping that in the intervening 18 months that DOB would adopt and say, if a person has this class of violation relating to this piece, that in the aggregate we can say that this is not a safe site and we are going to take action. And so I would ask that uh, we go over the rules and regs together. If those are not there and it is not clearly painted that way, that either DOB set forth a plan for adopting rules and regulations or know that the council is, is, is willing to come back and do it for you and our preference is to have the experts do it. Okay. Understood. Perfect. Uh, we, we, we did not expect to jump right in there, otherwise we wouldn't have invited everyone up. Uh, so, so early, give me one moment. Uh, it was actually answered um, in the great testimony by uh, the Department of Buildings, but um, the fact that the rules are, are being considered across the board or for, to some degree already in writing, um, I feel satisfied with the answer, so I'm good. Okay, I'm, can, I will continue with the uh, questions. Um, so if we can keep going, so let's just go to sanitation. So, so the initial question which I asked, which is just uh, have your agencies use this new tool? Yeah, good afternoon, Council Member. Tom Malora, New York City Department of Sanitation. Uh, sanitation issues permits for uh, solid waste transfer stations, and we issue permits for fill material operations. The extent of that is probably about 61 transfer station permits and maybe 9 to 10 fill material operation permits a year. It is in our rules that the applicant provide us with an environmental control board clearance letter prior to getting that permit renewed. So we will not renew a permit unless we receive one. If a uh, permittee for a, a transfer station is, uh, so what types of violations does the Department of Sanitation write to uh, waste transfer stations? Uh, they vary. Uh, failure to control dust, failure to control odors, uh, failure to clean their tipping floor, um, stuff like that, tracking outside the facility. And so I guess one question is, do you have occasion to issue more than one, more than a dozen, more than 100? What is the average number of violations? What would be normal? What would be outside normal? Uh, quite frankly, solid waste transfer stations from 19, in 1990, there were 153 facilities. In 1996, there were approximately 95. We are down to 61. That's through intensive regulations by the Department of Sanitation and the Business Integrity Commission. So the, the people, the facilities who are around now tend to operate better. The, the NOVs that we do issue are, the minimum violation is 2,500 and they increase to $10,000. Um, we issue s 
probably 30 to 50 a year in those categories. Um, but facilities are usually responsive. If facilities did not comply and they continue to violate, we would therefore revoke permits, which was done from 96 going forward. And I, that's why I think you see the reduction in the amount of facilities. Hey, I'm, my my uh, colleague who is the sanitation chair has, has brought up concern about transfer stations in his district, uh, as have some of my colleagues in, in their districts in the Bronx. Uh, and so I think there's the feeling that the, the dust spreads, that there are uh, concerns about uh, uh, smell and uh, also uh, the speed of vehicles going to and from the transfer stations and uh, a whole litany of safety concerns relating to them. Uh, can we use local law 47 to say, listen, all your trucks keep speeding through the neighborhood or uh, there's too much dust or you're, you're releasing smells into the neighborhood and say, if, if you aren't able to correct these behaviors, we're not gonna allow you to continue to do business here. Well, I think that that becomes evident through violations we issue. We have 22 inspectors who inspect on a 24-7 basis. Uh, I think it's safe to say that for the most part at this time, facilities know what they need to do. Uh, if we get facilities where we find there's, we're, we're issuing violations to 18 wheelers who frequent the facility, we will let the facility know that, hey, this certain uh, tractor trailer driver they're not cooperating, the violations are not working, please do not use them anymore. So there, there's a give and take. We try to be proactive when we receive complaints from citizens. We try to get out there within an hour or two hours. And what is, uh, do, you, do you happen to have the rule on hand that uh, you've already been using? I'm sorry, I do not. Okay, would you be willing to send it? Or you may have it. Oh, I do have it. Okay. It's 16 RCNY 4-5B uh, Section 6, 4-7B Section 6, 4-14B Section 3, and 4-4 Section 0. This is the, the I, I just want to thank City Hall because this, I, I wish this had been provided months ago when we initially asked, but as uh, s panels go, the, the agencies so far have been very prepared, so I appreciate you having that on hand. Um, would Department of Sanitation also provide a list of the violations you do issue along with how many of them? Sure. I think one of the reasons we were most interested in having Department of Sanitation here is one of the complaints we get in the district, which I think you already know, is uh, people who leave their trash out and uh, then the trash spills onto the sidewalk and then they don't clean their sidewalk or they don't clean 18 inches from their sidewalk, especially in residential districts throughout the city like mine where you have a the densest possible residential district under the zoning law, one of the densest districts on the uh, in, in the United States under the census tracts. And then we have that overlaid with commercial districts where you end up with like 20 million people walking down a block every year and you've got somebody who leaves their trash out and what have you. So I guess one of the questions is just from a quality of life standpoint, what can we do when there is a, a restaurant or a bar or some other commercial establishment that uh, is not being a good neighbor, that they're leaving their trash out far many hours beforehand, you write violations to them all the time, but they keep up the negative behavior. Well, we try to issue as many violations as we can. The assumption is that they're, they're getting paid. Uh, you know, we have a field force. We go out and we try to clean areas where we believe there are cleanliness issues. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly happy to say that our scorecard and street level cleanliness remains very significantly high. I think it's the highest it's been in, in many years. So I think we're, we're effective in what we do. From an enforcement standpoint, we try to be as responsive as we can to the community board, the district manager, and certainly the politicians. Do you have any specific sites or do you have ability to create reports that show the, the top offenders for sanitation in terms of people who aren't taking care of their trash, they're putting out early, they're not uh, doing the recycling, things like that? We would only know through NOVAS if somebody's a repeat offender and the violation would therefore get progressively higher. You would only know through? 
in issuing the violation, if, if we've issued to it before, it mm -hmm. would show that there, the penalty should be increased. And what's the system? Novus. Novus. And so is the Novus data shared with other agencies because I, or has sanitation ever reached out to DCA and said, hey, we can't get them to follow it. We've issued them dozens of violations and uh, we, we recommend that they not get their permit renewed or their license or their registration? No, I don't think that's occurred. No. I, I don't, we, we, as I said, we stringently monitor community cleanliness and that's done through scorecard and street cleanliness levels. Uh, we have very high numbers. Uh, if we find a, a, a problem with a certain location, mm -hmm. the inspectors will go out as frequently as necessary. So I, I um, and, and so do agencies ever reach out to you and say, hey, we looked at this and uh, and and this business has a, over a hundred violations that have been issued here, and and should we reissue a permit to them? No, we work cooperatively cooperatively with other agencies about certain locations that are problems generally for the city. I don't know if it gets granular enough to say it's about excessive summonses now. Would, would Department of Sanitation consider? figuring out what the metrics are for the number of violations where somebody, even if they're paying it as a cost of doing business, uh, probably shouldn't continue to get to accrue those violations. We're continuing to work with us, our fellow agencies to, to, to tighten things up. Okay, I think same, same as to, to DOB um, for, for sanitation. Um, I will say we, we are working on starting a business improvement district in my district, we're, we're very close, but again and again the neighborhood says to me, why do we have to pay more to supplement services that the city should be granting and at the same time uh, a lot of these services are necessary because the businesses, um, some of them are great, some of them have bad neighbors, and then when bad neighbor leaves their trash out, it gets tracked all over the sidewalk, and uh, then we have to use cleanup NYC, NYC cleanup funding to give it to you to sweep up extra or whatever when we just need that one business to either become a good neighbor or uh, no longer do business. Uh, so um, we, what type of timeline, when, when could Department of Sanitation get back to us with either a timeline for uh, promulgating rules to ensure that if a business have repeat violations that they will no longer be able to continue or uh, just let us know so that we can make a law? Well, I, don't th I don't think that it's in our purview to say whether a business can continue to operate. With. That's why we're working together cooperatively with DCA and, and everyone else to come up with a maybe a tighter system. I appreciate that. Uh, let's let's go to DCA. I don't know if we have to play music. Oh, perfect. Okay. I'm right here. Uh, so, 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 so same question. Uh, have your agencies used this new tool? So we issue licenses to a variety of businesses and individuals, and we automatically suspend those licenses for failure to pay fines. So I do have some numbers to share with you today that we, uh, in this year so far, we've suspended 539 uh, licenses, we have revoked an additional 28 licenses, and we have denied 107 applications for either a new license or to renew a license. Um, and we are in the process of uh, drafting a rule to think about how we best implement the tools that the council has given us, and we do uh, want to say that we appreciate the thoughtful and flexible approach that you have taken in crafting the legislation because as you highlighted, uh, there are things that are very particular about different licenses. Our uh, licenses cover everything from uh, ticket sellers to uh, general vendors and many other different types of businesses, some of them to companies, some of them to individuals. So the calculus for um, which violations um, and in what circumstances should affect someone's ability to get or maintain a license uh, is very particular to the category, and uh, as you recognized, and so we do appreciate that. And uh, I think to uh, touch on something that you asked the sanitation department, all of our violations are on open data. Um, so if folks are interested in what businesses are licensed by DCA, 
in their neighborhood or what violation um, what violations have been issued, they can always go on uh, and check that out. And I know that's also uh, as a result of thoughtful legislation by the council. You, you've made me very happy. I'm, uh, I'm just, I guess, was there a challenge for DCA in terms of getting us the report on September 1st as far as I've been advised by our council that we, we didn't get it on September 1st and I'm not sure if, I'm really happy to get these numbers about the 579, but um, I guess, uh, is there a way to have gotten this information without having had to have a hearing? Uh, so I think that we, uh, we're happy to get you whatever information we can to be helpful. Um, we will, as I said, be crafting a rule and certainly we will consult with all of our sister agencies and with the council as well to make sure that that rule um, accomplishes all of our shared policy goals. And again, we have, uh, I think we have a very robust open data set that covers a lot of different things on our, um, on our denials. So for instance, all of these denials are, uh, are updated weekly so that you can see who's been denied. Um, so we will we'll work with you to make sure that this information is delivered in um, the most timely fashion in the future. The, uh, are the denials going to be on open data too? Or? They are currently on open data. Okay. Uh, so, so one might argue that all these reports should be on open data anyway, so that's great. I just would have loved to have even gotten an email with a link uh, saying Here, here's, here's the data set. Um, we can so. send you that email right after this hearing. You can even send it to me during the hearing. Uh, so, <laughs> sure, th that that is helpful. So, I think one of the things that you heard me ask with Department of Sanitation and even with uh, DOV, I don't. Does DCA have any overlap in term? Do do you does DCA have licenses that are granted to businesses that uh, receive violations from DOV or Department of Sanitation? Uh, we do. Okay. Uh, would. Uh, and as well as DOHMH? We do. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll all, uh, and, uh, okay. Will all of the agencies agree under oath to work together to provide recommendations of violations that for thresholds for either outstanding debt or just repeat violations that they would recommend to DCA that uh, they might suspend, revoke, or not provide additional uh, li uh, additional licenses, permits, or registrations? DOB? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry. Um, will, will you agree to provide a list of violations uh, to DCA as they are working on promulgating rules for which they should consider them as repeat offenses that would warrant them not uh, granting or suspending or, or, or revoking a license or registration or permit. Happy to discuss that further with DCA, yes. And just keep, and keep us in the loop too. Sanitation? Yeah, we'd certainly be willing to provide information. DOHMH? Uh, can we share a violation email? We need you to say so. In the oh, well, he's going to, fair enough. Uh, the health department can provide violation information in, to DCA. Uh, uh, will you also provide recommendations on the types of violations that if they are repeat in nature, uh, suggest a uh, larger issue for which a uh, permit registration or license holder might be suspended, revoked, or not renewed? Uh, we can share our views about which are those sort of more egregious public health concerns. That's Great. what you mean? Yeah, and, and you'll include the council in, in that conversation. Sure. Great, back to <laughs> making progress. Uh, sorry, this I feel like this could have all been avoided a couple of years ago, but I'm glad that we're doing so now after the law at a hearing. Um, so if I may continue with, uh, okay, so actually DOHMH, I think it was your turn. So have you used the new tool? <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental and Health at the Health Department. Uh, the Health Department has about 45 different permit and license types with um, more than 62,000 uh, current permit or license holders. And uh, Article 5 of the New York City Health Code requires that before those permits can be renewed that fines be paid. I have a copy of the Health Code section if you want it. We'll take it. Okay. Uh, 
I've even I've the sergeant at arms will come and and uh, although if you're take gonna, I will hold on to it if you want. If you know, I can give it to you now, but I don't have a second copy. So, <laughs> and I've circled subsection F there for that, you. That is that is fine. Okay. It, perfect. Thank you. Please please con so um, and so tell tell us a little bit about that section. Okay. Um, hold on one second. So, in order to renew a permit or a license, you have to submit proof that you have no outstanding fines. Great. And, if, and it's an extremely effective tool to make sure that those fines are paid. And do you consider repeat violations from other agencies? Uh, we don't have we don't really have a way to do that, but we are thinking about how we can how we can bring that into our system. Okay. Um, we have a great panel of experts. Is there someone here who has an idea of a way to do that so that DOHMH can review other violations from other folks to see? I think we, we've we've talked and we're gonna we're gonna uh, explore that further. Okay, that is that is absolutely great. Okay, that that was, uh, and then fire department. Hello, Councilman Jason Shelley from FDNY. Have you used our tool? I don't want to rain on the era of good feelings here, but we've not used your tool. Um, but it's for, it's for a specific reason, a specific policy, policy decision we've made. Um, you've, you've mentioned quality of life several times. Um, the nature of the, the permits and the certificates that we issue are public safety in nature, and the, the nature of the violations that we um, issue are public safety in nature. And so um, they're of value to the applicant, the person or the business uh, looking for the permit or the certificate, but it's, they're also great value to the, the city of New York and to the fire department in particular. Um, so just to give you a couple examples, if, if you're applying for a permit to have some sort of um, hazardous condition or, or store combustible materials, you're going to um, learn about the rules in that in order to get that permit. You're going to perhaps take a, a test to show that you understand the safety uh, information. You're going to show us potentially that you've got um, outside certifications or, or, or other safety qualifications in order to do that. Um, and then importantly, it, it, the value is greatly uh, important to the fire department because Oftentimes, there's going to be an inspection regime associated with that permit. So you're going to ask to be able to do something on your property, store combustible materials. We're going to come out and inspect that initially and make sure that you're doing it in the correct way, you understand how you're doing it, that the person dealing with it who has the certificate um, uh, understands how to store it, understands how to move it, understands how to interact with first responders. Um, and then we're going to come back six months later or a year later and make sure you haven't moved those barrels of gasoline under a pedestrian walkway or in something else that would, would endanger public safety. Um, and so that's very valuable to us. And it's also valuable for first responders who are going to respond to an incident at that location. So if you have a permit um, to store combustible materials on the first floor and the local firehouse gets a, a report of smoke on the third floor, um, that information all goes into something we call SIDS, our critical information dispatch system. They're going to head to that location with the understanding that, oh, there's a permitted um, combustible materials on the first floor, we're going to take that information into account as we operate here. Um, so it's of great value to, to the, the uh, New York citizens of New York. It's great value to the first responders. What we don't want to do is anything to drive that sort of activity underground, drive it off the books. Um, we, would, we would fear doing such a thing if we began denying permits and denying certificates okay. to the people. And so we made a deliberate decision from a public safety standpoint not to do that. So uh, I have my, my committee counsel notes that section 113-01, uh, applicants delinquent on child support payments. So I, th I thought you might ask, the, 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 the two things that we would deny so something for, for so, so failure I, to I pay. Guess, oh, I'm sorry. I guess the big question is, and, and so we'll, we'll get to that question a little bit later, but I, I, my parents were divorced. I was raised by a single mom. and. Uh, my father did not pay child support. We had to seek collection. So these laws are important, but I guess why is a person violating the, the fire code repeatedly somehow less important and more likely to drive the work, quote unquote, underground versus somebody who hasn't paid their child support who should? So the child support is, I think it's a state, it's a statutory obligation. It's not a policy decision that we've made from the fire department. You, you are correct. Um, I, I wasn't there when that passed, but I, I believe we would have made the same argument then and, and would have opposed that then for exactly this reason. I don't think that person is less likely to drive uh, the work underground. I, I wouldn't argue that we should allow more of it. I would argue we should allow less of that. 
I, I, I strenuously disagree and struggle to maintain composure, but people who owe child support need to support their families. Uh, of course, uh, I would not disagree with that. Uh, and so I guess, um, so ju just you mean to tell me, so you, somebody's got barrels of gasoline, it's in a building, you show up, they say, yeah, I'm gonna put it there, they put it where they're supposed to, you come back six months later, it's under the pedestrian walkway, and you say, nope, that, that's a violation, you issue a violation, they pay it, you come back six months later, it's back where it was, you issue a violation, they pay it, so on and so forth, five years, they've gotten 10 violations because that's how long it would take. You, you would still support, continue to let this person store gasoline uh, on their site. So repeat violations, uh, a couple different things. First of all, the, the penalties associated with that go up at, at quite a large uh, scale at, for repeats. Um, depending on the severity, and I, I, without knowing a particular case, get into, the, get into the specifics, but you know, we may shut a location down, we may vacate it, we may stop a certain type of service until... Um, what, is the r what rules and regulations would you use for that? That is in the fire code, and I could, I'd be happy to follow up with you with that. Um, to, just to note also that um, a program recently we've worked with DOF on um, for frequent violators of, of um, particularly important violations that we've seen so that DOF can um, pursue them more aggressively than just a run-of-the-mill violation. And I think that's a program that is not uh, not been underway for very long, but I think it's showing promise. For the category of violations that you're speaking of that you think are dangerous enough that it is worthy of you shutting something down, would you share that list with all the other agencies sitting at the table so that they may consider those repeat violations when they issue new licenses, permits, or registrations, I'd or revoke, or suspend them? I'd be happy to share that information. Perfect, and you'll share that with the council as well. Just to be clarified, for, for what's the threshold? If, if a violation that could result in vacating a location, is that what? The th the th I, I am. I, I just want to make sure we give no, you what no, you, no you worries. For. As I've shared with the other agencies, I, I lack the expertise that you have. I, I am concerned that my constituents are saying how little expertise I might have, but uh, you fake it till you make it. But key thing here is just uh, you set the threshold. We've, we've empowered you. You're an agency. Please work with the other 13 ECB issuing violation, ECB quality of life issuing agencies to say, hey, um, these are things that we think that if the person has repeat violations over and over again from us, that's a reason for you not to issue their DCA license or their DOHMH license or their DSNY license or their DOB license. Happy to do that, thank you. That is amazing. Okay. Um, in section 810A, which uh, DOB happens to have on hand if you don't, uh, there's a requirement that the violations, the notices of violations include specific language that says, quote, if the Environmental Control Board or the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings orders you to pay a civil penalty, failure to pay that penalty in a timely manner could lead to the denial of an application for a per license, permit or registration, or to the suspension termination or revocation of a license permit or registration issued to you by a city agency. Have you updated it yet? Starting from the left. Could you, uh, I didn't quite understand the question. What is it you're asking? Have your notice of a violations been updated to include the written warning I read? Oh, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> no. Will you do so? I need to review review it a little more. If necessary, we will. Uh, how long will it take you to get back to us on whether or not you will comply with the law, or you may have a new yeah. answer? We would love to work with Oath on this, yes. No worries. Uh, next. I'm, I'm going to have to look into that for you. I'm not sure. Certain one way or the other. No, no worries. Uh, how, how long will it take you to get back to our committee council with the, with your timeline for implementation? I, I will go back and ask right away, and I will get it to you as soon as I can. Perfect. I think we have to switch so you can be extra on the home center. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the health department did update its notice of the violation. Great, thank you. And to avoid the game of musical chairs, we will let Jeff go briefly, uh, and we may call him back, but just to avoid musical chairs. And we just thank Department of Finance for their cooperation in all of this. Continue. Uh, yes, I believe the Department of Consumer Affairs has updated their notice of violation, notices of violation to include the written warning. Um, I'm at 90%. We'll get 100% for you by the end of the day. Great. To uh, Department of Sanitation, you indicated that uh, you required a certi certification that they, that uh, Private transfer station permits had uh, no outstanding ECB violations. Is that the same for the other six violations that you, uh, sorry, six permits that you provide, including recycling, uh, sorry, collection bin registration? Not for collection bins. For registrations, we re registration facilities are either licensed by DCA or permitted by the Department of Environmental Conservation. Our registration process with those sites were just ministerial in nature, and it was to gather information on recycling rates. So collection bin registration is through DCA? No. Sorry. The, the registration, the recycling registration facilities? Yeah. Those two, I think it numbers in 80, 24, and maybe 54. They're either licensed by DCA or licensed by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And then DCA does the enforcement? DCA does, yes, does some of the enforcement. Do you do the, the other enforcement? We do certain types of enforcement, yes. Uh, does DCA consider DSNY violations when you uh, renew recycling facility and collection bins? I think there may be some confusion. We, um, we do not permit those bins, DCA. There may be another agency. But we can, the, we can. The, the, the ahead. Talking about scrap, scrap metal processors. Mm -hmm. Those we yeah. do. Those okay. We do. Okay. So the, the 54 <coughs> sites are scrap metal processors. I'm sorry for not referring to it properly. Okay. So, okay. so let's, so we'll, we'll go one by one. So the private transfer stations, that's all you, you regulate and handle their registrations. Yes. And you withhold if they have any ACB violations. Yes. Intermodal waste transfer facility registration, similar? It's similar, we, we don't. Okay, it's tell us. It's so a registration. It's, we, we, theoretically, we were preempted from registering the sites that are on rail lines. It's the, the, the Federal Railroad Act really takes precedent. It's just a site on a rail line where material is then tr transported and placed on a, on a rail container. There's not much associated with the activity. Oh, so. So you regulate, you respond to complaints, you issue violations to them? Our regulatory scope is very limited. So it's, it's federal? Yeah. Okay, and so, and, and are you able to deny a registration there even if they have ECB violations? As of now, no. Okay. And that is, and you but believe I, that But I is don't know what violations would re they would really incur. Okay, uh, if, if, if we can sure. learn more. That is sure. what we are here, and I, and then fill material operation permits, you regulate and? Yes, they provide, we need a clearance letter. We ensure that they don't have any outstanding violations. Yeah. Great, and scrap metal facility is DCA? Scrap metal's a DCA, and the recycling, handling, and recovery facilities are state regulated. Okay, so for but, the scrap metal right. facilities, and, and, and they're, just, they're very new registrations. We just started registering them this year. 
Okay, it's so a, for the scrap, it's a new process. So for scrap metal facility, do you require the, EC, the ECB violation certification? No, it's just the ministerial registration is what we issue. Okay. Does DCA require that they don't have any EC, outstanding ECB debt? Uh, I will have to look into that for you. Okay, if, if not, this is a place where we would be at DCA and DSNY, and I guess, do you consider one another's violations or other violations that a scrap metal facility might have accrued? Both DSNY and, do you consider repeat offenses? Like I said, we just started registering okay. them, so the prerequisite was to have a DCA license and for handling for facilities, they needed a DEC registration as well. Okay, collection bin registrations. You regulate that and you register that. Collection bins? Yes. Yeah, yes, we do. <laughs> okay, uh, and so, and, and the types of violations that might be written to a collection bin, is that for folks who are collecting like clothing or what is, that's a, okay, it is a, so those are the clothing, yeah. clothing uh, and so I know that there's a problem all over the city with some of them that are real and legitimate and some of them that may not be. Right. So what, what do we do? So what types of violations could somebody get for that? And uh, what do we do about folks who have the ones that aren't supposed to be there? I would need to provide you with, with information after the hearing on that specifically. Wait, what, I, the, I, to, what the exact process is, I don't think it okay. involves many NLVs. Uh, it's, it's, our scope there is very limited. It's just a formal registration, I believe, as well. Okay. We, we have uh, representatives from City Hall here, and I'll just say that the, the same lines of questioning that I, I have given, uh, I, if, if that could be brought to the agencies that aren't present here to avoid a part two to this hearing for that specific set of questions. Uh, we're, we're, are we all set? Perfect. Uh, Okay, so every agency has, hold on. So I wanna thank Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for showing up with a copy of the Article 5, 5.05 subsection F. Uh, the question that we have is if you only consider uh, oath violations of your code or, the, or, or for other agencies, the rule that you have is only for your code, and as is apparent from this hearing, we want you to consider all of them. Uh, understood, and uh, as, I, as I testified, I think a, a couple moments ago, um, we're, we're, we're exploring how we can collaborate with our sister agencies. Give me just one moment, sorry, this is, I, 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 uh, I wanna thank you for your time. My preference was not to have to even have this hearing. I understand that it is, a, a, it is taking longer than it possibly should, but we're just trying to go through it and there are many of you on the, I wish there were 13 agencies here, but um, <laughs> best way to avoid it is to work together before the hearings, give me one moment. Okay, uh, Patrick uh, Whaley at DOB, you, you, you looked like you were, uh, felt like you weren't getting enough questions. <laughs> uh, so according to a report from November 2016, the Department of Buildings has by far the most outstanding ECB debt with over $900 million, 
including penalties and interest owed to the city. No other agency has even half that amount. I understand this is partly a reflection of the scope of your agency's responsibilities, but I think there's been a clear policy statement made by the council through Local Law 47. And also, Council Member Vaca has recently passed Local Law 160 of 2017 that we expect persons with large outstanding debts and who are refusing to repay those debts to have their permits denied. Even if you may disagree with the policy system, do you intend to comply with both of these laws going forward? Yes. And I guess one question is, you, in your testimony, mentioned that you collected 1.4 million. What is the challenge to collecting the other 900, uh, uh, 900 million? What, what is, why, so is it just people, yeah. What is the impediment to collecting all of the DOB ECB debt? Would, uh, what I can tell you is certainly with Local Law 160, um, and come the end of this year, December 28th, it takes effect, we will we'll have a process in place for you know new building, major alteration, demolition, in place of assembly permits, where the building or the owners, owner or owners of those buildings have $25,000 or more in debt. We will have the means in place at that point in time to withhold permits uh, based on that debt. Presumably, that will make a big difference, hopefully, in the city, you know, um, getting these respondents to pay up. Not to show a card on a pending legislative service request on our parlance and for people watching at home, this is a, when a council member says, I want to draft a bill. Uh, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. If I own a building and I hire a contractor to fix something, and then they do something wrong, but I don't know because I'm not a contractor, I lack that expertise. Um, showing a lot of things I don't know here. But uh, a couple months later, DOB comes by, they, they use the wrong wiring. They did the wrong type of tubing, uh, what have you. Uh, who gets the violation, me or the person who did something wrong? Um, if the department is able to identify the contractor, um, the contractor would receive that violation. Ordinarily, for the types of violations you we're talking about, ordinarily things like work without a permit, the contractor is not able to be identified, so the owner of the property would receive that violation. Ultimately, it's the owners of the property who are responsible to ensure that any work that happens on their property is being, is being performed appropriately. So I think therein lies the, the larger rub. So even the most sophisticated property owner or manager is, I, I don't know many that would likely say, oh, you, you got a permit from DOB. I, don't, I doubt even if they asked for a copy of the permit, anyone could actually read the permit. Um, I, I quite often when I get something from DOB, end up calling you on the phone to say, what does this actually say? What does this actually mean? Um, so I guess, the, and I doubt that they can Folks are going to go into the, the the business information system to double check their contractor. Would DOB consider promulgating rules that allow you to pierce through the the building owner to whoever did the work? And if the building owner comes with evidence to oath or to you that says, "Here's the money I paid. Here's a invoice and a canceled check," that you can take that to say to the contractor prove why it wasn't you who did this work? Are you asking if there should be the means in place to relieve the owners of the responsibility to ensure that contractors they hire are doing work in a code, safe and code compliant manner? If, that, if that's the question, the answer is no. How about joint and severally? The, the, for, for in layman's terms, for those watching, just it means you can hold both people responsible at the same time. We, we can and do do that when, when we have the ability to do so. Again, if we can identify the contractor, both the contractor and the, uh, and the owner of the property would receive the violation. Um, but I, I guess that the question, so, and, and the process being, do they go to oath to, to, to the technical term would be implead, but in, in just plain language, it would be bring, to, to point the finger and say, that's the person you should hold responsible. So if I'm a homeowner, I'm watching at home right now, and I got in trouble with DOB because a contractor did, did something wrong, and they didn't get their permit, they did it without a permit, uh, and I, who, who, what do I do? Do I hand the, the invoice and the canceled check to some, 
who do I give it to at DOB? Do I give it to Oath? How, how do I get that person on the hook instead of me or with me? That would be addressed at Oath. Okay, so that happens at Oath. And so as far as I understand, Oath not in a position to bring in new parties. I think the agencies have to do so. So how does it work? It happens at Oath. You go to Oath and you say, it wasn't me. It was my contractor. Oath says you're still responsible. And then does does DOB then issue a new violation or re amend their violation? How do you do that? I don't know if there'd be the occasion or the need to reissue a violation. Ultimately, the judge at Oath is going to make a determination as to who's responsible for the violation. And that will determine you know, the further course of action. J just to be clear, in the back and forth we just had, you didn't actually give me any clear way for a land for, for a building owner to like get the the contractor on the hook. I think that's something that would they would have to make their case to oath, and the judge would have to make a determination. At that point in time, it's it's sort of beyond the buildings department. We issue the violation; it needs to be adjudicated at oath. But the person who did something wrong is the contractor. The contractor doesn't pay the price for having done something wrong. Maybe they get a negative Yelp review, maybe not. But the negative behavior and the uh, non-compliance continues. So if, if DOB is interested in working with us, otherwise we'll try to figure out some sort of legislative framework. Uh, we did something on, I think it was introduction 811 or 814 or 812 about allowing multiple parties to be requiring agencies to issue violations to multiple parties. Uh, we will send you a copy of that, and hopefully we can work together on that before having to do, do that. We could have done it on the whole batch of laws that we passed together. Following along, um, so Deputy Commissioner Whaley, you testified previously before this committee that for, quote, work without a permit violations, end quote, a corresponding civil penalty is issued that, quote, in order to get the permit, you will need to pay the violation because not to do so kind of makes a mockery of the idea of getting the work without a violation in the first place, end of quote. In our research for preparing for this hearing, we found more than one example of a company that received multiple, quote, work without a permit, end of quote, type violations who were also issued or reissued a DOB permit within the past year and who had tens and even over $100,000 in ECB debt prior to the issuance of that permit. We would be happy to have staff share some specific examples with you after the hearing, but while I understand you have concerns with broadly applying local law 47, certainly these instances which you yourself identified, we should be more vigorously applying local law 47 as a policy matter. Is that not so? I think I understand that question. And uh, <laughs> what you're saying is correct. So as a general matter right now, the only occasions where we're not um, the only occasions where we're withholding permits based on debt is when a work without a permit violation has been issued. If there are, there should not be any cases where a work without a permit violation has been issued, that violation has not been, the penalty has not been paid or corrected. If, if that hasn't happened, we shouldn't be issuing any permits. If you're aware of examples, please bring them to my attention and we'll take a look at it. We will do so. Uh, In our staff's research, we I have a great staff. Uh, we in our staff's research, we found an instance of an owner of multiple properties who had racked up over two hundred thousand dollars in environmental control board quality of life violations from the Department of Sanitation, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Fire Department of New York, Department of Environmental Protection, and the Department of Buildings. This owner has also appeared on Public Advocate Tish James's Slumlord list, uh, which once upon a time was. Public Advocate Bill de Blasio's slumlord list. From Department of Buildings, this owner received violations that included working without a permit, and the last year this owner and associated LLCs have been granted at least nine building permits. I understand that we don't want to punish the residents of his buildings any further by denying permits for needed work, but this owner also seems comfortable having a large outstanding debt to the city. Is it the practice of Department Buildings to reach out to any other issuing agencies to cl for clearly bad actors like this to see if there are licenses or permits issued by their agencies that could be withheld as a tool to encourage compliance? I don't believe so, no. Would you adopt such a practice? Happy to consider it. And uh, could we have the response to that consideration back within the next week? 
Yes. Great. Uh, I would also ask the other agencies present if they would be willing to use the tools at their disposal to help enforce compliance for a bad actor like this. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned in, our in my testimony, uh, we license a very specific list of businesses. So in the event that such a bad actor um, was licensed by us, we would certainly be willing to consider it. Uh, yeah, and the health department has done some work along the lines of what you're suggesting, looking at some of those, the landlords that are on these, these lists and um, looking with uh, sister agencies to, to see what sort of patterns we can uncover and how we might be able to elevate enforcement. And so we, we think it's a good idea and we'll continue to do that. So, so what I said before stands as, as to the permits and, and certificates that we issue uh, regarding public safety. However, we'd always be willing to consider an idea that somebody had for sure. I want to take a moment to just thank Department of Sanitation and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for being the only covered agencies to send a report to the City Council under Local Law 47. Um, I just want to note for Department of Sanitation, you have a incredibly responsive commissioner who is incredibly accessible and responds to emails from both elected officials and community members very quickly and takes things as they are, and I want to just appreciate that, and I imagine that is part of why you were able to be compliant, so thank you. Thank you. So there were a number of agencies that weren't here. We will be sending these questions to the agencies to, to answer in, in lieu of being here and in lieu of a part two. Uh, um, if there are any questions, anything I missed where anyone would just like an opportunity to speak or? Perfect. I, I want to thank my committee staff for making this happen. I want to thank the Department of Finance for working with us through here. Um, it's been 18 months. I wish we didn't have to do this hearing in order to start this, restart this conversation that we started about two years ago. Um, but I'm looking forward to working with you. I thank all of you for giving commitments. Um, between your five agencies, you represent the, the bulk of it and you represent the permits that matter and the violations that are issued most often. And I honestly believe that if we use the tools on the local law 47, focus a little less on um, the ECB debt per se, but the actual number of violations that continue to accrue, that we can get to a place where we're actually doing what we're hoping, which is changing behaviors and improving the quality of life in the city. I wanna thank you for your partnership. Uh, it's a big city, lots of work to do. Um, and just uh, thank you and I hope that uh, our, our next meeting is a uh, press conference announcing all the great new rules and regulations that we have as well as all I I'd love to see a huge dip in the number of quality of life violations we're issuing because folks now see that if they keep being bad actors it's going to be a problem so I hope our next meeting is to announce the great work and the meeting after that is to announce the results uh, we will send additional questions and uh, uh, Without, we have a member of the public. Did you want to testify at all, or are you all set? I was all set, actually. No one? I asked all the questions that I didn't ask the people panel. So I Perfect. Our, our member of the public was just saying that they, they had their questions answered, and that is a great thing. So uh, I hereby adjourn this meeting of the. Wait, no, I have one question. Oh, that's not fine. Then, well, then we'll call you out. <laughs>
So what we're going to do is we'll, we'll call you up to, to ask your question. We're going to have you fill out a witness slip. Oh, well, first, if you can share your name. Nicole Patterson. No. Okay, Nicole. No. No. All right, so what, what, what we'll do is uh, we, we will thank the administration, and if you want to... Pardon? Absolutely, that would be fine. Okay, so if you would like to just uh, share your concerns on the record, if you want to move over a little bit so that uh, you're... Take one, move over to your uh, right, My one right? seat. Yep. And, uh, and, uh, and so what we're going to do is if you share what, uh, your concerns, um, I, I understand that a member of the administration has already offered to talk to you after this hearing, but uh, we're going to let the administration go and excuse them, and uh, we will be happy to forward their questions, but please do. Yes, uh, concerning illegal conversion, which is part of the quality of life. And uh, my husband and I have called the DOB many times and having illegal conversion above us, beneath us, beside us, and we've had no resolve to the problems at all. I looked up my landlord, and since you were speaking about violations, I looked up for him and the numerous buildings that he has, and he has a number of violations, and I'm, how can he continue to have a business and nothing is happening, there's no help for the public when we report an illegal conversion. Who do we call, who do we speak to? Because I've, I've called 311 and they don't even know what the codes are when they fill out the, the, the complaint. And you ask them, well, what does this code mean? Nobody on 311 knows what the codes are. Okay, so um, first, uh, if, I, I love 311. It is my biggest talking point that we should work with 311. If 311 worked, I'd be out of a job. So uh, the key thing is that you can, uh, you can work with your local council member. My office and, and our staff here will connect you with who your council member is. And when you have specific issues where you call 301 and it doesn't work properly, if you let your council member know, they can let 301 know. I actually email 301 this morning to tell them and they weren't working properly and that way that the complaint can be followed properly but uh, um, part of this hearing is specifically if somebody's engaging in illegal conversions if they're engaging in illegal behaviors and they're getting fines and just paying it or not the goal is that they can't keep it up and we want to do it in a way that doesn't force tenants out but uh, does force the landlords to we even had my husband call the the landlord mm -hmm. and his response to my husband was get a house that is inappropriate uh, and uh, we will connect you with your council member and make sure you have the support you need and we're going to also uh, connect you the uh, member of the administration has graciously offered to go over it with you himself and uh, I am also hoping that Department of Buildings will work with uh, the uh, executive director of 311 to make sure that when folks have specific violations, 301 knows how to respond to it. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for being here, and I'm hoping that we can work with you through your council member to get you satisfaction. Thank you very much. You got it. Okay. Uh, seeing no. Okay. Um, we're going to uh, recess for uh, five minutes, uh, and uh, then we will likely adjourn. Thank you.
watching uh, remotely at all? Or? A little bit, yes. I want to thank uh, our council member colleague, uh, David Greenfield and committee member uh, who has been participating with many of you at home via the live stream or watching TV. Uh, and uh, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate your leadership and uh, especially your probing questions and wish you a happy and healthy new year. Shana Tova, we now adjourn this meeting of the Committee on Governmental Operations.